Uh, welcome, everyone, to another episode of Cyber Coast to Coast. Uh, this is Craig Schober coming at you from the West Coast here in Costa Rica. And I'm joined, as always, by my brother, Scott. Uh, hey, Scott, how you doing? Hey, how's it going there, Craig? And I'm over here, East Coast, out of our headquarters, Metuchen, New Jersey, right outside of New York City. All right, very well. Um, we've got uh, three good stories lined up and some uh, additional things uh, on uh, air tags, uh, as you'll you'll probably have seen in the headlines. <laughs> every every headline seems like. Um, but first, uh, before we get into anything, just want to mention that this episode is sponsored by Dark Kryptonite. Uh, Dark Kryptonite stops ransomware, malware, and phishing attacks in their tracks, uh, uh, virtually eliminating cybercrime, fraud, and information warfare. Uh, they utilize advanced blockchain algorithms and zero trust models. And you can learn a lot more about all that stuff on darkkryptonite.com. Uh, kryptonite with a C, like as in crypto. Um, I want to do a quick rundown i guess on this week i didn't i didn't i usually go through and look and i didn't find any big stories per se you know usually there's a big one or two like a huge hack or breach or something's you know that gets kind of national attention i don't i didn't necessarily see that this week but i do see three interesting ones nonetheless and i'm sure you'll uh, our regular listeners will recognize some of the names and the players and the technologies in all of these stories. So, and that's part of the reason why I think I, they drew my attention. So hopefully yeah. they'll draw others' attention and they'll get something from it. Uh, a quick rundown. Um, we've got uh, a believing computer story, a uh, ransomware gang, uh, and a double extortion. I guess we'll, we'll talk, we'll get into more about that. What, it, what exactly is double extortion and, and the numbers involved with this particular um, attack. Uh, we got, again, chat GPT still in the news. Um, got some stolen credentials on these dark web marketplaces. They're being sold. And we'll we'll, we'll talk more about that and, and the repercussions of something like that. Finally, uh, another we got another story from Security Week uh, involving TSMC um, and more ransomware, of course. But this is a, a chip giant. Uh, they make chips for everything from iPhone to Samsung to uh, it's just about any consumer electronic device you can think of. So what happens when they get or their vendor gets hacked. Uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, so, uh, but before we dive into the first story, want to do a quick uh, little—I don't know—we call it kind of a almost like a recap or a re uh, uh, retelling of the the air tag saga. Um, <laughs> as, as some of you, just a quick backup. As some of you might know, we're, we're we uh, make technology that. Uh, text air tags um and you know we work with law enforcement and, and even consumers uh more and more on this because it is a consumer device uh so this any air tag story catches our attention and I, I think it's catching everyone else's attention because it seems like every week there's a new uh, a new angle a new a new way to steal with air tags a new way to get stalked or hacked or whatever um this story uh more rarely seen is actually a positive story <laughs> on air tags um as you know you can put an air tag in just about any device and use it to track thieves at, or at least find where your stolen device is at that moment now you're not supposed to go and confront these people uh these thieves yourself you're supposed to contact law enforcement but sometimes people are impatient or they're just too angry to think it through so they go and and confront them and stuff happens uh you know there was a i think there was a woman who confronted a thief just a few weeks ago for i think it was a stolen vehicle and he was killed uh so this stuff is you know this is serious stuff but in this particular case this story 
uh, I found this link on Fox News, but again, you could probably find it on just about any news organization because it these things tend to make national headlines whenever they hit. And this was a Texas family that tracked down, uh, I guess, grave robbers who were stealing these expensive uh, vases from a uh, you know a nearby funeral home. Uh, I didn't realize this. Some of these, some of these vases, you know, the average price gets up to about six hundred bucks a vase. And yeah, when you have expensive. a, you, <laughs> yeah, and when you have a uh, an organized crime, uh, you know, steal uh, theft of these, they're stealing dozens or even hundreds of these, and that that adds up to. In this case, it was sixty two thousand um, dollars was retrieved after the you know the the police were involved and they caught the, the grave robbers. Um, I don't know. What do you, what do you make of this, Scott, uh, this kind of thing that we, are we going to, you think we're going to see more positive stories about this uh, stolen property retrieval, or is it just going to go back to the stalking stories that we're more used to? I guess uh, probably a combination of both. It, it is nice to see. And I'm glad you picked this one. Cause it's nice to see something positive for a change. Cause I feel like, I mean, lately I've been barraged with a lot of people that, in fact, in fact, I had an individual that came by here twice just this week alone to our headquarters, and we don't really sell to the general public. And he he was from another country. He was on asylum. He was um, being tracked um, by, by GPS trackers. When he was in one country, he feels like he's being tracked here in the United States. And he's in fear and he needed a, a sweep done to his vehicle. And he was concerned about traditional GPS trackers, but also the, uh, you know, tag trackers. And, and of course we make tools and such for this. And uh, it was interesting to, to hear how, how, how often these things seem to be happening. And uh, I read a lot of stories about people because I'm on a lot of different LinkedIn groups and Facebook groups about stalking and tracking and, how people are looking for solutions like some of the tools that we make, like our blue sleuth light to detect air tags and things of that sort, because it's become such a problem. But this story is interesting. I like the fact that the, the tag is being used for good. Um, I guess criminals here in this case know that these, these vases, or I guess you call them a vase when it's above $500, I guess is the way it works. <laughs> certainly. Um, they've got a, a market in, in, in selling stolen vases because people are, are overpaying to get uh, these things at grave sites. And I think it's, it's sad because they're trying to capitalize on people's loss and sadness when you're distracted and, and you really can't keep focus and you can't worry about it. And I'm guessing not many of these people have the time or the wherewithal to work with police and write up an investigation, this and that, because they just lost a loved one. In this case, the, I guess it was an uncle. In, in this case, the, the, as, as I'm reading through the story here, that, that passed in his gravesite is where they stole the vase. And um, it's really sad and heartbreaking that people do that. But it's nice to see the positive side, um, the fact that an air tag could be put on something that has value to somebody, be it, uh, you know, monetary value or even just maybe emotional or some significance they can associate, they can track down the bad guys and arrest them. And that makes me feel good. And I encourage people, if you have something of value, yeah, put, put it on, not just your luggage or your suitcase, which reminds me, I'm going to be going on a trip soon. I'm, I'm going to start putting some, from some fresh tags on my, my luggage. So if something happens, at least I could track them and follow them, which I think is important. Yeah. Yeah, good idea too. Um, yeah. I one of the things that caught my attention at this story was the fact that it was grave robbers, and I immediately thought, like, oh, are they, you know, just literal robbing of graves? And then I started to think, wow, are people going to be putting air tags somewhere around the corpse or some on some, you know, because a lot of people are buried with with jewelry or certain, you know, precious items or something, mm -hmm. and those some of those items have value. I wonder if air tags are going to be now buried with those items in a casket waiting yeah. for thieves, you know, uh, to, to steal them. I suppose anything's possible. Um, oh, definitely. So I guess we'll yeah. wait to hear that story. <laughs> yeah, I'll share a story that kind of parallels. It's not exactly about gra grave robbers or anything else, but it kind of, it just, it opened my eyes to something. I was testing 
our little blue sleuth light. It's just a, a low cost scanner to define tags. And I started walking around toward the woods outside of our building the other day. I wanted to find an area where there was no Bluetooth, low energy or no tags picked up. And I found it way in the back by the woods. And we're right on a kind of a endangered bird sanctuary swamp behind our building. It's really beautiful, but there was no wireless activity. And as I started walking back from the woods in the parking lot, I'm looking down at my unit. All of a sudden, boom, a tag popped up, a detection of a tag. And I started walking around and I walked toward a vehicle of one of our machinists. And I said, oh, it's telling me there's an air tag in his vehicle. I said, let me go inside and go see. So I walked up to the machine and said, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, do you have an air tag in your vehicle? And he kind of laughed. He goes, yeah, how'd you know? And I said, oh, I had a blue sleuth light. I happened to walk by your vehicle. I, I detected it. And as I got closer, I saw the signal strength intensity pick up. I said, it's just wonderful to, to see the product works great. And then as I'm standing there talking to him, it, it vibrates in my hand. I glance down, I look, and it says, a tile is detected. And I said, oh, that's weird. I said, in our machine shop, I said, I just detected a tile. I said, do you have any tiles around here? He goes, that's funny. He goes, I just bought a brand new uh, card, a tile card that's in my wallet. He goes, funny, you saw that. I just just literally put it in there the day before. And I started laughing again. I had another aha moment. I says, wow, this really does work well. I, without looking for it, it alerted me, just holding it in my hand to two tags and again, it, not that anybody was doing anything wrong or whatever else. Um, it, it just it just showed me how effective and how useful the world's simplest tool is at detecting tags that are in spots that you just did not even know. And that's cool. And I'm kind of looking forward to more stories and hearing from customers as they kind of locate and find tags. Yeah, it's always great to hear. Um, you know, especially when you're whether you're testing the unit, um, doing, you know, a Q and a or a QA, uh, type of thing right before it goes out the door, you know, these stories are going to keep coming. And now we're part of the story, you know, cause we're sort of yes. in that little ecosystem of tags and trackers and stalking and all those things that go with it. So, uh, I expect to see a lot of great, um, customer testimonials coming our way. Oh, definitely. Um, In fact, it makes me think maybe we should have a, a little contest for, you know, the month's best story or something. And we'll, I don't know, send them a little mm -hmm. gift or a thank you note for sharing your, your success stories uh, using our tools. Cause I, I'd, I, I love to hear feedback from customers when they share, Hey, I used your tool for this and it helped me do, do something or improve my life or made me feel safer, or made a difference. And um, we've talked a lot about our stories in the past where our tools have, have literally saved people's lives, where they've helped them locate lost items and things that they, they couldn't find. And it, it's nice to be part of a success story for a change where technology is used for good. Uh, and I always commend that. All right, let's get on. Let's move on to the first story. Uh, but first, a quick reminder that this episode is sponsored by Dark Kryptonite. Stops ransomware, malware, and phishing in their tracks, limiting cybercrime, fraud, and information warfare. And Dark Kryptonite uses advanced blockchain algorithms and zero trust models. And learn all of that and more on darkkryptonite.com. A uh, quick word about sponsors. We are currently looking for new sponsors. Um, if you hear this show and you think it's a fit for your audience, your customers, then we'll be happy to talk to you and uh, see, what, see if we can work out anything. Uh, always happy to spread the word about uh, good sponsors, good products, and good uh, cybersecurity solutions. Um, and of course, this you know expands to our our email newsletter and our website, and you know we could even create videos. So we're open to your suggestions. So uh, contact us uh, at the uh, address this podcast um the email address and um we'll get right back to you and see what we can work out uh what's this the first story we've got the headline eight base this is a ransomware gang apparently eight base ransomware gang escalates double extortion attacks in june and i saw this one on bleepingcomputer.com and first thing I thought was double extortion. What's that exactly? I think I have an idea, but we'll mm. I'll let I'll let the expert Scott explain that. Um, but I guess 
one of the things that uh, jumped out at me on this particular story was um, the uh, attack uh, from this gang have are kind of being tracked and, and posted and there's been a steady stream of them, but you know, they're in the low single digits and suddenly there was a huge spike in the beginning of June. I, I guess they were kind of sitting on a bunch of probably a bunch of fishing attacks they had they had going out and they had these exploits they collected and sort of um, took advantage of them all at once maybe and, that, and that's why you saw this sudden spike in in reports of ransomware and and, the, and this kind of thing but um I just thought as the, the one of the funny things I noticed was on their actual page you know again this is a this is a, an illegal ransomware gang, but they and yet they have a public presence on a public uh, forum of sorts. They're, they have a, you know they have a Twitter presence. They have their own website, and and they're in other areas too. And and one of their quotes was, "We are honest and simple pen testers. We <laughs> offer companies the most loyal conditions for the return of their data." Um, you know, it, just the way it's written it is the you know usual uh kind of english as a second or third language kind of that that sort of yeah. approach but just the fact that they uh try to position themselves as pen testers you know like we're hey we're white hat we're not even we're not even gray hat much less black hat you know it's it's a complete opposite of what's going on um i, I don't know do you how do you how do you find uh this kind of uh yeah, I think it's, the, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I, I mean, I call somebody that does true pen testing somebody that has some advanced skills. They're not, they're not a newbie. They don't have. It's not a simple job as they kind of associate with simple, um, and and just the the fact the way they kind of sp- spell this out in the sentence is almost like they're making a defense, or or asking you to like you know bleeping computer readers to sign it, kind of sympathize and say. Because they've mentioned here, the list contains only those companies that have neglected the privacy and importance of their of the data of their employees and customers. So it's kind of like a little bit of a Robin Hood mentality. Hey, we're only going after this unique group because they were negligent in keeping their companies or their employees' data safe and private and the customers' data. So it's kind of justification for what they're doing. Hey, we're bad, but we're not really that bad because we're doing good. Um, it, it is kind of spooky. The, the other thing to your point, extortion, um, extortion is just what, what you think it is. And and in the sense of a ransomware attack, typically what will happen is a cyber criminal gang, such as this one, eight base will go in, they'll hack into the company's network and before they do anything else, they'll exfiltrate all the data that they can. They copy down oodles and oodles and terabytes of all the data, not even knowing what's valuable and what's not. Once they have that, they, they keep that and store that on the side. That's to be used later often if a company refuses to pay the ransomware. So a company may say, hey, uh, we're not going to pay you the million dollars or whatever it is that that you're trying to extort out of us. Um, and then the company, the bad guys, the cyber criminals say, okay, fine. Now we're going to go public and we're going to take all this data that we exfiltrated and we're going to make it public. We're going to embarrass and shame you. And now it's out in the wild west and anybody could see who your customers are and your the confidential information, your IP, whatever you're trying to store on your network. And, and that's kind of like a double whammy. So it's used, extortion is usually used as leverage when ransomware demands are not met. And perhaps this this group could be a little bit inexperienced, 8Base. And of course, as I say that, you know what that means. They're probably going to be targeting us as a company because they usually do that when you when you call out somebody or question any of these, these uh, ransomware gangs. They like to uh, go after people and send them messages. So in the weeks to come, we'll see what happens there. But that double extortion can be very painful um, it, 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 I thought the funny thing is it, to me, these, this is an inexperienced group. Why? Well, they've only been in business for what, a little more than a year. The sheer number of attacks that are reported is not that high, although we've, we've seen a recent spike. So I, I'm guessing, um, 
you know, into the second quarter this year, they found a successful formula that works for them. And maybe it's that added component of, of double extortion that they said, Hey, wow, if we do a ransomware attack, we're not getting the money we thought, but if we do the double extortion, we'll get a lot more respect and get the money quicker, faster, and, and a higher payout. And they're having some success. And that's why I probably took off. That's just my guess. I'm speculating, but um, the fact they announced mm-hmm. so many victims in such a short period of time, 35 victims, is kind of interesting. And I also wanted to get your take that using the, the dark web as a form to kind of publish victims and what you got and you're you're you're, they're kind of using it like success stories i mean we we have testimonials from customers when they say hey berkeley we love your products you helped us do this or that and we appreciate that the feedback you get it's almost like they're they're using the dark web as an opportunity to kind of brag and show how how successful they are at uh performing these ransomware attacks double extortion what do what do you think Oh, it's, it's exactly that. And I think they're using uh, the dark web to kind of, like you said, they're kind of launching. These guys are new, but in the further down the story it reads, um, there's a, a more well-established uh, group called Ransom House and uh, VMware uh, Carbon Black team who, you know, uh, publishes reports about these. They follow the, you know, tactics and and all the you know antics and and criminal activity from the all these types of groups they suspect that that this eight base is kind of a new a new bunch of you know guys hackers but they're kind of an offshoot from this better established random house and it, it kind of it does mirror uh things that you see in the you know legitimate business industry you have uh, sometimes you have these employees from big companies either getting poached or announcing that they're going to they're they're leaving this company and they're doing a startup, you know, and they yeah. do this by um, making some big hay about a new technology or a new news item, or they start some controversy in the news so that to get everyone to say, "Hey, look over here, look at us, we're doing stuff too," because they're you know they're new and they want to they want to get their name out there and they want to establish themselves and this kind of sounds like a form of that they're they're just jumping you know who knows maybe they maybe they were uh, let's let's pretend and and you know write a quick little story you know these these were disgruntled random house hackers that had access to some of these breaches uh some of this data so maybe they walked away with a few things and said we're you know we're going to start our own uh a little hacker contingency because um we don't like the way that you guys are dispersing the payments or we don't, you know, we don't like the, the con- employee contract or whatever they do over there. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, they walked away and, and right away they have a kind of a head start because they have all this data, you know, I mean, this is me just supposing, but I don't see why it, it couldn't be a possibility, you know, that, that sure. kind of stuff. So it just shows how these criminal organizations, they, uh, mir- they are mirroring, the business world, the legitimate um, world more and more. And it makes you wonder if in the future, will they perceive, be perceived somehow as legitimate? Um, I guess time will tell. Hopefully it never gets to that point. But, um, you know, and if enough of these things happen and it's it's accepted as the price of doing business, who knows, maybe uh, someday they will be considered legitimate by the average uh, you know, Joe public. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. That's for sure. <laughs> right. Um, let's, uh, move on to our next story. Uh, uh, once again, though, I want to remind listeners about dark kryptonite, our sponsor this week. Um, you could visit dark Uh, kryptonite is a C as in, you know, crypto, uh, and learn more about ransomware, malware, phishing, and how they're preventing these types of things. These are the stories we talk about every week. Um, Dark Kryptonite has what they believe a handle on this, a new kind of a new paradigm for security. Um, it's exciting. Uh, we've personally gotten some kind of hands-on demos 
uh, more on that in the future. We'll hopefully uh, give our audience a sneak peek on that kind of stuff. But in the meantime, get all the information on Dark Kryptonite on their website, darkkryptonite.com. Okay. Uh, next story comes from Hacker News. And this one is over 100,000 stolen chat GPT account credentials are being sold on dark web marketplaces. So again, here we have the dark web marketplace uh, doing its thing. And we're kind of peering into it to see just what happened uh, this time. And it appears, what have we got? 101,100 uh, compromised account credentials. Now, just to be clear, this isn't uh, open source, uh, um, uh, chat GPT, uh, what are they? Open AI, right? Open AI runs chat GPT. You now, Open AI hasn't been breached in any way. These are these are individual user accounts for either bad password management or, or what have you. Uh, individuals have been um, their account user account user accounts have been compromised, and now they're being uh, offered up for sale. And um, I thought the breakdown was kind of interesting uh the most accounts in this particular bat were from india over twelve thousand uh stolen credentials from there and then you got other pakistan brazil vietnam egypt france morocco indonesia bangladesh and of course the u.s is in there too with various accounts uh credentials being uh, stolen being traded sold um uh, you know, this type of thing, you know, I have a chat GPT account. Uh, I believe you, you do, right. Even, mm -hmm. even dad, yeah, I do you know, our father does, he started yeah. a chat GPT for him. Uh, it makes sense. You want to, it's the kind of account. It's not like a Netflix account. Well, I guess you used to be able to share passwords easier. I think they, they clamped down on that recently, but you know, you used to be able to share passwords with people you trust streaming accounts and, and things like that but there's no good reason to share an account on with a, a chat gpt because one of the whole the whole points of it is that it kind of not only does it store all your queries and your questions and answers and things you get back from chat gpt but it supposedly is is learning about your your needs and and what you want so it's, it's a personalized sort of playlist if you will of all your mm -hmm. Chat GPT interaction, so you wouldn't share that. You're, so you're going to have your individual, you know, your your user account. You're going to create that, but it, it makes you wonder what the value of this is. Um, of course, there's password reuse and things like that, and there's always value there. So if they have the password for your Chat GPT, mm -hmm. they might have the password for your Facebook, for instance. Um, but I think it goes further than that because a lot of these things, if you can um, connect the user to a company or a government agency mm -hmm. or a person of importance, suddenly now you have insight into things that they're looking at, things that questions they're asking. It's kind of like getting someone's browser history in a way, but yeah. even more advanced than that because you don't just have something they were looking for you now have the answer that they were presented by chat gpt and you mm -hmm. can now you know it, it, it makes me think i wonder if uh let's say a, a politician gives a speech and their chat gpt account has been breached now you you now know what part of the speech was written by ai and what part was just mm -hmm. written by their you know speech writer or something which doesn't sound to be too important, but you know, I could imagine a politician um, being, uh, you know, a, a kind of a, a ransomware, a you know, blackmail or of some sort, saying like, "Hey, we're going to release all this information we know about all of your speeches and what you've been looking at, what you're what you're interested in, and and all of these types of things, things you don't want the public to know necessarily. They may not be illegal, but they could be embarrassing." And now you have, you know, you have leverage over someone that has uh, an important job or has some degree of power. So that's, I guess, that's really where the 
this the real threat and the fear of this these types of things leaking uh i don't know scott what do you do you think do you think something like that is a is a, a feasible uh use case for for these thieves or is there or is something is something even greater uh danger probably or yeah absolutely and i think it's all the unknown i mean you just just to your point thinking about like you know maybe it's a politician or something and a politician may not be looking to necessarily spread good cheer on some of their policy. They probably are more likely going to be looking at a chat chat GPT to look at something to throw at their opponent, look at some bad things they've done. What better way? I mean, you can go out and do a Google search and find a lot of history on things with chat GPT. You can itemize and say, give me the, the top 10 strongest things that, you know, that uh, I'm running against this politician that I could use against them and da, da, da. And it spits back, boom, 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 boom. And probably a lot of those things are things you never even knew. Um, So it's really, it it digs deeper. It provides more focused response when you do a query and allows you to respond much better to whatever the situation is. So now imagine you have the ability and you see somebody's account is compromised and now you can access it. Now you see what prior uh, questions that they posed to chat GPT, what kind of Mm -hmm. research they were doing. um, What are their like, you know, their likes, their hobbies. It it gives you a well-rounded understanding of the person, but even to the point where you can really see their specific things that they queried. Um, So it's like you said, it's more than just, Hey, here's the website. Somebody, browsed or a particular search they put into google it's more it's even more granular I mean, i think the more granular you where you get the more you start to get inside someone's head and know secrets about them and truths about who they really are and and in the world of politics that's probably the most important thing for people because they love to love to do that they love to get into someone else's head and find all their faults and use that to their advantage and put themselves up on a pedestal. So that's just one example. But but you think about this, that over 100,000 people with compromised accounts. Now, maybe that's not huge in comparison to the 100 million plus users uh, that are on chat GPT. But then I was thinking about it saying, you know what? It's only been around, uh, you know, really took off last November, December it's not like it's been around that much more than a year. So all the login credentials for these 100,000 plus people that are compromised, they're all new, they're fresh. When something's new or fresh on an account in the dark web, they command top dollar. Stolen fresh credit cards, you can get a t- two, three times the ask if you're selling stolen credit cards. Same thing here, these stolen credentials, as opposed to if you look back at one of the many T-Mobile breaches or Yahoo breaches, some of that data sometimes is six years old, seven years old, 10 years old. The people have passed on and, you know, they've changed accounts and providers and, and uh, uh, logging credentials multiple times, whereas this is fresh. So this tells you this is something that's um, very valuable, I guess, to for the for those that are compromising those accounts. Mm. Yeah. And um, getting back to our, our example uh, just for a minute, uh, you know, we have a, actually have a real world example. I just uh, thought of uh, back a few months ago, there was, uh, it was a, a Republican uh, commercial and they claimed that it was the first, uh, you know, campaign commercial ever written by AI. Hmm. So you could imagine, you know, if they use chat GPT or some other service, but it's very easy to imagine if they use chat GPT, you know, we're we're just seeing the dirt they're trying to dig up on their opponents or on mm-hmm. the you know the party's you know kind of goals and failures and all those things. You know, we just saw that in the thirty second spot. Imagine all the things that were surfaced and searched for that we didn't see, and that's what you would have access to if you breached that the right person's account, for instance. Wow. So it just shows all the untapped. Uh, I guess dirt <laughs> in terms of and and mudslinging that you see in, in politics, uh, and that's just politics. You know, you get into business and more almost spying and um, you know state state actors, those that type of thing. 
And you could see how uh, it could become a treasure trove to actually gain access into someone, into the right person's chat GPT account. Um, yeah, definitely. So we'll, you know, I, I, I said it before and we'll keep saying it. These, uh, these stories are going to keep popping up, especially with chat GPT. It's not going anywhere too soon. Uh, so we're going to see more stories involving that. And hopefully we're not going to see too many stories about breaches and because hopefully people get their, get those passwords in check, uh, make mm -hmm. them strong and change them semi-regularly. If you're not, if you don't have a regular uh, change of that kind of stuff, you know, get, secure those accounts. Yep. He must, right. It kind of, kind of reminds me of, you remember when the internet first took off and, you first heard about Google and you went on and you tried a search on Google and you were kind of like dumbfounded and say, wow, how did it know that? How did it do that so fast on the world wide web and the world of the internet was all new back then. But it, it, it really stood out as a moment. I remember where I was sitting and, and when I first tried a search for Google and it just blew me away. I, I kind of have that same feeling with chat GPT. It's not like I you, you try it once and you're done with it. I downloaded the app on my phone and I use it on my desktop and I find I keep going back to it because I'm very curious about how well it works and how accurate it is and um, how amazing it is in, in just response time and depth of understanding and clarity in its writing. It's, it's pretty powerful and I could see it be used, you being used more and more as more people start to appreciate um, how valuable it is. For, for good, hopefully. I mean, obviously the bad guys are going to be using it for wrongful purposes, but I'm looking forward to hearing some of the, the advanced things that it, it will be used for, for good in, in the coming months. Mm -hmm. Yep. Counter. Yeah. Good uh, countermeasures. Cybersecurity. I, you know, I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, it's hard to talk about chat GPT without people coming up with all the negatives about yeah, people losing their jobs and hackers hijacking artificial intelligence for nefarious purposes. Um, but it's like everything else; it's just a tool. And so you give good people a tool, and they're going to do good things with it. And those are the stories uh, that I'm still anticipating. I haven't heard many of them, but you know that doesn't sell on the news generally. So. Mm -hmm. You got to kind of dig a little deeper for those, but they'll 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 be uh, popping up more and more. I'm sure. Definitely, yeah. Um, let's see here. We got. We can move on to our third and final story. Mm -hmm. uh, just one more quick reminder about dark kryptonite. Um, you can stop ransomware, malware, and phishing in their track. Phishing attacks in their tracks and you know, eliminate cybercrime, fraud, and information warfare by utilizing advanced blockchain algorithms and their zero trust models. And you can learn all of that on darkcryptonite.com. Uh, we got this headline uh, out of Security Week. ESMC says supplier after ransomware group claims attack on chip giant. Uh, yeah, DSMC has become a giant. They got my attention because they're the primary designers, I guess you could say in partnership with Apple. Um, they they designed the uh, the series of chips that have been in iPhones for years and years. Mm -hmm. And Apple has moved their desktop chips to Apple Silicon, the M chip series. Uh, TSMC is behind that. They're I think they haven't yet, but they're poised to introduce the three nanometer uh, chips, which will, uh, you know, greater efficiencies and a smaller mm -hmm. wafer and all that stuff, um, which is really exciting because um, you don't usually, you know, usually you, you uh, make a processor go faster these days by either upping the the chip speed or adding more cores so you could do kind of parallel multi-processing um, but when you can actually shrink the the die size down um, you're now you're now creating efficiencies of like I don't know 25 percent increase while also using less power which is always mm -hmm. exciting to me 
and it's what keeps the tech industry kind of chugging away. Sure. Um, but yeah, in this case, yeah. What were you I was going to say, what, what is it called? It's, it's a, uh, is it Moore's law where, where it keeps getting yeah. uh, faster, less power consumption. I think that also in, in turn generates less heat. You have much mm. shorter traces for the, for the information to travel. So that that's a huge amount of um, speed increase. It is fascinating. I, and it, it's funny you picked this story. I, di- I didn't tell you before we, we chatted, but this was actually one of the stories I reported on today for cybercrime radio. I do, I do daily headlines and, mm-hmm. and talk about things. And this one was, this one was um, one of the ones that was selected. So certainly keep, keep an ear out for uh, cybercrime radio and you'll hear some of my highlights on it. But one thing in the research on the story, because uh, TSMC is Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company. And, and they're actually responsible for 65% of the world's semiconductors and 90% of the high-end chips. And that would be something, to your point, talking about some of the more advanced things that Apple's doing and a couple other companies. Um, it, it really, targeting a company like that is scary because it affects every one of us. In other words, the parts are pretty much in all of our phones. When they represent 65% of the world's semiconductors, um, that, that that's a concern that uh, if they were you know taken out or whatever or some of that information is truly held hostage and I think that's specifically why we see a demand of 70 million dollars that's a little bit higher well it's a lot higher than the you know the typical <laughs> ransomware payout is about four million dollars from large companies uh, that's where it's ranging at right now uh, in in 2023 so 70 million is pretty steep. And um, I think just the just the fact they uh, a, a notorious ransomware gang lockbit has been everywhere, and and they, they're getting a lot of the headlines and causing a lot of havoc with companies. They may actually fetch this money. I don't know. I'd be it'd be interesting. Uh, and and they're threatening to publish um, lots of things, not just login information, but password details, uh, entry points, how they got into the network, samples of data uh all, all kinds of dirt they've got that they say they're going to put out there so they're they're serious about this they really want this payout a big payout i guess so i think the days to come we're going to find out more fallout from this story and and this goes on top of already a crippled um sector the the semiconductor sector as you know probably most of the listeners know has really been uh, crippled coming out of the pandemic three plus years Everybody was at home and everybody said, well, I need a new phone or I need a new laptop and a smart TV and electronics, electronics exploded because people had time on their hands. They weren't traveling as much. So they had some disposable income and everybody went out and upgraded their electronics, which in turn, to some degree between the pandemic, logistics problems, shipping challenges, and just a shortage on semiconductors, it changed uh, the electronics industry, and we're still struggling to get parts. It used to be parts would be, you know, stock to three, four weeks from a, a traditional um, company like an Arrow or somebody else that carries semiconductors. Now you're still seeing things where it's in excess of a year. So the dis- supply demand curve got all messed up. The automotive sector got messed up. The electronics sector as a whole did. That all funnels down to even businesses like ours. So if, if there's any customers out there that are hearing this from of Berkeley Varitronics, I, I apologize if our, our deliveries are a little late from time to time, but it, it all trickles back to companies like this, unfortunately. Then when I hear that they're being targeted with a ransomware attack, I say, oh no, it's going to make deliveries even worse. <laughs> so mm-hmm. scary. It affects everybody though at the end of the day. Yeah, and back in... 2018, there was a big uh, production halt to the same company. Um, it was a result of uh, the wallet ride malware, mm-hmm. and it caused it caused havoc. Just like you're talking about, you know, kind of like the uh, precursor to the big uh, chip shortage that we're kind of still going through, getting getting through slowly now. Yeah. Uh, so it, you know, I I look look back and it didn't say it wasn't clear at least to me if they paid any kind of uh ransom to get their uh production line back in order but it was down for i think about a week 
well, it caused major disruptions. And a lot of that was about uh, the iPhone chips at the time that they were providing. And everyone was worried, that they, you know, uh, God forbid the new iPhones <laughs> don't ship this year. It's like, you know, become yeah, some yeah. kind of feels like a national holiday of sorts, you know, for consumers. It's like everyone waits and the, the press and everyone reports on it and stuff. Oh, and, sure. But that's just one example. There's you know hundreds of uh, big uh, companies that rely on these types of chips. And then there's below them, there's thousands and thousands of companies that rely on those big companies. And so, yep. like you said, when, when the big guys, you know, face a problem like this, everyone's affected. Um, sure. Backs up. And in, in this case, uh, this uh, particular breach, I think it was a, um, it was one of their vendors, uh, Taiwan based yeah. Kin, Kinmax technology. So it wasn't a direct breach on uh, T TSMC, but you know, they have so many vendors. It, it's not surprising that one of their vendors will, kind of throw a wrench in the work if they yeah, get yeah. breached. Um, and this particular vendor uh, works with um, Cisco, HPE, Microsoft, Citrix, VMware, and NVIDIA. So some of those, are, you know, big players, big U.S. companies. Uh, and hopefully they won't see too many uh, delays in their production um, plans as a result of this breach. Yeah. Yeah. It looks like it may have some widespread impacts. We'll see how it plays out, but, but you're right. I, I guess it was your vendor or supplier that was breached, but it, it kind of stands out to me the importance of deciding who you partner with as a company. You can't just partner with everyone. You got to be somewhat selective. And I think that's where having good cyber hygiene within an organization, it's only as good as the cyber hygiene of, your partners and other companies you deal with. So that's why I always encourage people to make sure you're very cautious. Don't just sign up with everybody. Make sure that you check that they have some best practices in place, especially if you firm up relationships and you're really dependent upon one another. And in this case, Taiwan Semiconductor, I'm sure there's hundreds of key suppliers that they are partnered with that are very strategic to their overall success. And, and, it, it, uh, it really affects global economies now and countries when, when companies this big get involved in, in things uh, or are threatened to have uh, major problems like this. And, and then there's also the impact of the intellectual property, what's stolen and, and what's copied. Companies like this, when, when they're shrinking technology and making advances, sometimes just to build a foundry might take the better part of five years to adopt to the reduction in semiconductors for a new line, um, that's a huge investment. We're not talking millions or hundreds of millions. We're talking billions of dollars in years. Um, and that affects global economies like nobody realizes. It's, it's just unbelievable impact. So anytime I hear a company like this that's even tied to something as, as a large of a ransomware, I kind of get a little nervous. Mm -hmm. Yep. The big big players deal yeah. with big problems, I guess. Yeah. All right. Um, that about, uh, do, yeah, that about does it for this episode. Um, you got anything coming up you want to mention or plug or. Yeah. Well, I do, I do want to uh, certainly uh, give a shout out to anybody that's attending the black, black hat conference. That's going to be coming up in August. That's one of the, one of the coolest conferences that I usually go to, I've, um, I've been there before, always have a great time and uh, get to meet a lot of great colleagues. Uh, it's it really spans the whole week. It technically goes from August 5th through August uh, 10th. The two main days that I'll be there, are August 9th and 10th, and I'm going to be um, working with uh, Cybercrime Radio and we're going to be doing live radio interviews for key people at the show floor, Black Hat. Uh, so I'm going to be running around different booths, different people. So really look forward to, to seeing you there. And uh, if, if you, if you uh, have something special that you're launching or announcing your company, certainly reach out to me. Let me know. Hopefully we can connect up. And who knows, maybe you'll be on the, uh, the live radio feed there for Cybercrime Radio. But always a great event. 
and uh, really look forward to that in Vegas each year. So, um, you know, re reach out to me or drop me a note on Twitter or, or uh, through the website, scottshober.com and be happy to connect up there and, and chat a little bit. All right. Sounds great. Looking forward to Black Hat as always yeah. every year. Um, want to quickly thank, finally thank um, Dark Kryptonite once again for uh, sponsoring this episode. You can learn all about them on darkkryptonite.com. And I think they updated their website recently. We might yeah, have been mentioned did. on there somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It's beautiful. You, stop, stop by and take a look at it. Uh, it, they've got some great information. They're doing some exciting things. And I would encourage people to reach out and ask for a demo. Cause I think when you see a demo of some of the great stuff that they're doing, uh, it, it's game changer type of, of technology. And, and I know that, uh, they've got some, some very interesting customers right now that have been given fabulous feedback. So I encourage you to take a demo of it, reach out, request a demo right on their website and uh, take a look through some of the stuff there and, and get some great videos up and, and other information that's starting to fill out their website. All right. This podcast is available on YouTube, Spotify, Google, iHeart, Apple, Amazon, and more. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and review. We'd like to hear from our listeners, um, questions or comments, whatever you got. Uh, you can reach us best on uh, Twitter at Scott BBS or just visit the website scottshober.com for more info. Uh, we read your question or comment on this podcast. We'll send you a signed copy of uh, one of our books. Um, thanks for listening and tune in uh, next time for another new episode packed with news and tips. Stay safe uh, from uh, the West Coast uh, in Costa Rica. This is Craig uh, signing out. All right. And this is uh, Scott here from the East Coast signing out. Stay safe, everybody. With your host, Scott and Craig Schober.